Hi, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we sort through the big Vatican and Catholic stories of the past week, try to separate the wheat from the chaff, and make sense of it all. Here's what's on the menu for you this week. We begin not with California dreaming, but Helsinki dreaming. Pope Francis and his Vatican team increasingly are looking to Helsinki as a source of inspiration for ending the war in Ukraine. We will explain why. Then, second, what we've got is One of the Empire Strikes Back. One of the more famous books about U.S.-Vatican relations was titled Parallel Empires, and this week, the conservative wing of the Catholic Church in the United States made its voice heard here in Rome, challenging the Pontifical Academy for Life on birth control. We'll explain what that was all about. Then, third, the crackdown continues. Pope Francis this week imposed tight new financial controls on foundations and other Vatican-sponsored entities We'll look at why this is a classic example of a kind of double whammy, both internal and external pressures on the Pope. Fourth of missed moments, an Italian TV show this week revealed plans that were never realized for what would have been a remarkable meeting in 1964 between Italy's top communist and its most ferociously anti-communist cleric. We will speculate a bit about what might have been. Finally, new twists on an old story. Probably Italy's, the Vatican's, most famous giallo, that's the Italian word for an unresolved mystery, is the 1983 disappearance of a 15-year-old girl by the name of Emanuela Orlandi. Two new developments on that old story this week. We'll take a look at whether there's any stake beneath all the sizzle. That's what we've got for you this week, so please stick around. Okay, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, December 13th in the year of our Lord, 2022. We are four days away from Pope Francis's 86th birthday on Saturday, so let's offer up a hearty buon compleanno. Happy birthday to the Pope. We begin this week with the Pope and specifically with his growing fascination with the capital of Finland, Helsinki. Now, you may think that is an odd thing for a pope to have a fascination with. There are only about 15,000 Catholics all in in the country of Finland. It was kind of lost to the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation. And in fact, there is no bishop in Helsinki right now. The position has been vacant since 2019 and Pope Francis has never gotten around to filling it. So why the obsession with Helsinki? Well, it's not for ecclesiastical motives, but geopolitical ones, because Helsinki was the site in 1975 of what are now known as the Helsinki Accords. Basically, this was a deal between the Soviet bloc and the Western world. All of the countries in Europe well, with the exceptions of Andorra and Albania. I'm not sure why the countries that started with the letter A checked out of the whole process, but they did. Everybody else, however, was involved along with the United States and Canada. And basically, it was a deal to reduce tensions during the Cold War. The Helsinki Accords committed both East and West to respecting territorial integrity and national boundaries, to respecting the right of a people to self-determination, to respect basic human rights, and so forth and so on. And it was seen as a pivotal moment in kind of steering the world away from superpower rivalry. And of course, you know, the ultimate nightmare scenario, which would have been a nuclear war between the Soviet bloc and the Western bloc. And instead of putting it on a path of kind of rough cooperation and detente. Now, that was, of course, almost a half century ago. But nevertheless, increasingly, Pope Francis and his top diplomatic aides are pointing to Helsinki as an inspiration for what the world needs right now in an effort to resolve the war in Ukraine, which, of course, 
threatens to become yet another moment of superpower rivalry between Russia and its satellites and the Western world. I mean, Pope Francis has already said that we are fighting a third world war in pieces right now, with Ukraine being the most prominent piece. Recently, Italian Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Vatican Secretary of State and the Pope's top diplomat, said we need to revive the spirit of Assisi. Pope Francis, when he went his, was in Kazakhstan in September, said the same thing, that we need to revive the spirit of Assisi. And today, this very day, there is an event taking place on the grounds of the Italian Embassy to the Vatican that is co-sponsored by various Vatican entities and also the Italian government, devoted precisely to this, to how the Helsinki Accords of 1975 could provide a kind of inspiration and maybe even a blueprint to new negotiations today that would lead to a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine. Now, why is Pope Francis, why are his Vatican aides so fascinated with Helsinki as a precedent? Well, I would say there are three reasons. One, the Vatican was involved in the Helsinki Accords in 1975. In fact, the leader of the Vatican delegation at Helsinki, who was widely credited with being very important in terms of brokering the final deal, was then Archbishop Agostino Casaroli. Casaroli went on to become a cardinal. In fact, he was the Cardinal Secretary of State under St. Pope John Paul II. Casaroli famously is the architect of the policy of Ostpolitik, Eastern, the Eastern policy under St. Pope Paul VI, which was a policy of outreach to the Soviet world. That is, instead of condemnation and confrontation, trying to put the emphasis on dialogue, peacemaking, and reducing tensions. That policy was controversial among anti-communist hawks in the Catholic fold, and particularly among leaders of churches behind the Iron Curtain, who felt a bit betrayed and let down by it. Nevertheless, it was seen as a success, particularly by the more progressive wing of the Catholic Church. Pope Francis, in a recent interview with the Jesuit-edited journal America in the United States, actually praised Casaroli as his diplomatic role model. So the fact that the Helsinki Accords were seen as one of Casaroli's crowning achievements obviously helps explain why the Pope and his team are so focused on it. Second, the Vatican has always seen Italy as a kind of natural ally, in fact, its most natural ally on the global stage. They see Italy as a kind of amplifier for their humanitarian and diplomatic agenda in global affairs. And this is a clear case in which Italy and the Vatican are in lockstep. At this conference today, not only is Paroline speaking, but it was originally anticipated that Italian President Sergio Mattarella would be speaking. Now, unfortunately, over the weekend, Mattarella came down with COVID, and so now he's sort of isolated in his residence here in Rome, will not be in person at today's conference. But nevertheless, his fingerprints are all over it, and there is a very warm relationship between Pope Francis and his Vatican and President Mattarella. I think there is great hope on the Vatican side that together, Pope Francis and Mattarella might be able to move the ball in terms of galvanizing the global community into something like a new Helsinki summit. And then third and finally, Helsinki is remembered as that great moment during the Cold War when the world took a step back from the brink and opted for peaceful cooperation rather than armed conflict. And you know, it is a promising precedent from another point of view, because at the time, it was seen as a kind of win for the Soviet side and for Russia. It was seen that the West was essentially signing off on Soviet, if not occupation, at least heavy Soviet influence on all over Eastern Europe, including the Baltic states. That was controversial at the time, but nevertheless, the point is, it was something the Russians felt good about. And the idea is that perhaps appealing to that precedent might entice the Russians into dialogue once again, almost 50 years later. And it comes at a time, of course, when the Russians sort of have their backs up 
about the Vatican because of the Pope's other comments the Pope made in that America interview about Chechens and Buryats and brutality in Ukraine that irritated many Russians. I think the hope on the Vatican side is that by appealing to the president of Helsinki, they might be able to change the calculus. Obviously, we will see if any of this actually bears fruit, but God knows any initiative that seems to carry even a scintilla of promise of ending this conflict is worth pursuing. All right, let us change topics. So as I mentioned at the top, there was a somewhat unusual conference that unfolded in Rome during this past week. It was sponsored by Ave Maria University in the United States and the Ethics and Public Policy Center in the United States, both of which, broadly speaking, would be seen as pillars of the conservative wing of the Catholic Church in the United States. And this conference brought together jurists and academics and intellectuals of various stripes, all of whom, basically speaking, came together to defend the church's traditional teaching on sexual morality, beginning with the ban on artificial birth control that was expressed in Paul VI's encyclical Humanae Vitae in the 1960s. Now, you might ask, why are they doing this now? Well, the reason is, this is all calculated to push back against recent initiatives of the Vatican's Pontifical Academy for Life. The Pontifical Academy for Life was created under John Paul II, and for a long time, it was the stronghold in Rome for the most robustly, you might say the most militant, pro-life voices in the Catholic Church. But all that has changed under Pope Francis. It now has, what would you call it, much more moderate to progressive leadership under Italian Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia. And what happened is that over the summer, this newfangled Pontifical Academy for Life put out a document, which was basically a collection of papers from a conference it had held, bringing together theologians, some of whom argued that while the church has norms on things like birth control, in concrete situations, the pastoral application of those norms may differ. Basically speaking, they were saying there are circumstances in which Catholics might be justified in using birth control, despite the church's, the, the official church teaching on it. Now, that was very controversial among conservative Catholics who don't think there's any wiggle room in church teaching on this and other subjects. And then things got worse over the summer as this debate unfolded because the Pontifical Academy for Life took to its Twitter account to put out a tweet saying that the teaching of Humanae Vitae is not covered by papal infallibility. This, too, is a very disputed point among Catholic conservatives. And then things heated up even more in October when the Pontifical Academy for Life appointed as a new member an Italian economist by the name of Mariana Mazzucato, who, by the way, is an internationally renowned economist. She advises the UN and several governments around the world, but she is also pro-choice. And conservatives thought it was inappropriate to appoint someone who breaks with the church on abortion to such a high-profile position on an academy whose mission is to promote church teaching on issues such as abortion. So all of this controversy kind of boiled over, and it brought this unusual assembly of the sort of top-notch, you know, A-list conservative Catholic ethicists, theologians, academics and intellectuals on sexual morality. One of them, in an interview with us at Crux, described the recent activity of the Pontifical Academy for Life as, quote, embarrassing, and said it is creating confusion about church teaching, and kind of explicitly said the purpose of this conference was to push back. Now, there's no immediate indication that the Pontifical Academy for Life plans to change tack, although it did release a statement saying it welcomed all voices in the conversation. You know, we will see what influence this has, but it is a reminder that issues such as contraception, same-sex relationships, abortion, and so on, there may be settled Catholic teaching on these questions. The application of those teachings, however, remains very much a bone of contention in the life of the church. All right, third up this week, we have the Pope's continuing crackdown 
on financial transparency and accountability. This has been a theme of the Francis Papacy from the beginning. He has created new laws and new institutions intended to ride herd on the use of money in the Vatican. Obviously, all this an attempt to respond to what has been a very checkered history of Vatican financial scandals over the years. And the most recent move in this campaign came last week when the Pope issued a motu proprio, that's an amendment to church law under his, uh, on his own initiative, creating new financial controls for foundations that are sponsored by the Vatican. Now, you may wonder, well, what are we talking about here? Well, here's the thing. Virtually every department in the Vatican has at least one, and in some cases more than one, foundation that is intended to raise money to support things that it cares about. So, for instance, in 2004, under what was then the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Healthcare Workers, that has now been folded in to the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. But anyway, that council created a foundation called the Good Samaritan Foundation, which was intended to raise money to treat diseases such as HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, in the developing world, above all in Africa. Or, for example, the old Council for Culture, which has also been folded in to a new dicastery, created a foundation called STOC, Science, Theology, and the Ontological Quest, intended to support initiatives to bring religious thinkers in conversation with secular thinkers about, you know, sort of egg-headed things. And there are, you know, literally dozens of these kinds of foundations in the Vatican, some of them big, some of them mid-sized, most of them pretty small. And over the years, they have occasionally been sources of scandal. In 2017, for instance, the then president of a foundation that raises money for Bambino Gesù, that's the papally sponsored pediatric hospital here in Rome, was actually convicted by a Vatican court of abuse of office because he had taken money that had been given to Bambino Gesù to take care of sick kids and used it instead to remodel the apartment of a Vatican cardinal, the former Secretary of State under Pope Benedict, Cardinal Tarsicio Bertone. Now, this wasn't just graft. I mean, the idea was that apartment was going to be used to raise money for Bambino Gesù. So the guy, Giuseppe Perfitti, oh, by the way, his last name means prophets. I mean, how perfect is that? for a guy who was convicted for financial crime. But anyway, you know, he had a legitimate argument for doing this, but nevertheless, he was convicted because the statutes of his foundation didn't, that this was the argument anyway, didn't permit that use of funds. Winding the clock back even further, in the 1990s, there was a small foundation by the name of Ecclesiasticus Monitor, which basically printed decisions by the Roman Rota, that's the Vatican's main working court, and sent them off to bishops around the world. In fact, this wasn't even a Vatican foundation. It was sponsored by the Archdiocese of Naples, but everybody thought it was a Vatican foundation. It got embroiled in an insurance scam in the United States and ended up being sued by 13 insurance commissioners in the United States trying to recover millions of dollars that had been squandered. Point is, these foundations over the years have acted autonomously, often without any regulation or oversight, this is an effort to make sure that that situation is remedied. Pope Francis has said that from now on, the Secretariat for the Economy will have a kind of vigilance role in making sure these outfits are playing by the rules. Now, this is not merely the product of the Pope's own desire for reform, we should say, but this was also a recommendation, a very strong recommendation, by an outfit called Moneyval, that is the Council of Europe's anti-money laundering agency. And Moneyval, since the era of Pope Benedict XVI, has done regular inspections of the Vatican and then given it a review. Now, the reason this is important was because before the Vatican agreed to subject itself to Moneyval inspection, there was a very real danger it was going to be blacklisted on international markets, which would have meant that it was frozen out of many markets, or that where it was able to conduct transactions, it was going to have to pay exorbitant due diligence fees because people thought it was very risky to do business with the Vatican. In other words, at a time when the Vatican is already in hock, 
and trying to figure out how it's going to fund its pension obligations, this would have been a very serious financial blow. And so this is a classic example of how reform in the Catholic Church works. It, can, it is usually a combination of an internal desire for purification and getting things right, but also strong external pressure that makes the momentum for reform basically irresistible. We'll see how all this plays out. All right, next this week, musings on a missed opportunity. So there is a TV station up in the, north, the northern part of Italy in the Liguria region, which is the region that has Genoa as its capital, that did a program this week that revealed for the first time publicly a very interesting appointment that was set, but that never happened in 1964. Basically, Palmiro Togliatti, who was the founder and leader of the Italian Communist Party, known by its Italian acronym PCI, Partito Comunista Italiano, had called up Cardinal Giuseppe Siri of Genoa, who led the church in Genoa for 40 plus years, had called him up and said, listen, I am going to make a trip to what was then Yugoslavia, a part loosely part of the communist bloc. So I'm going to make a trip to Yugoslavia for my vacation this summer. But when I get back, I would like to come see you. So the appointment was set. Unfortunately, Togliatti, while he was in Malta, not uh, Yalta, rather, not Malta, Yalta, had a massive heart attack and died. And so the, the meeting between him and Siri never happened. Now, what makes this interesting is that Togliatti was the leader of the largest and most important communist party in Western Europe. It never took power in Italy, but it routinely pulled at around 30, 35% of the vote. It was a major electoral and political force in this country. He was a personal friend of Joseph Stalin. Stalin actually offered Togliatti the position as the head of Comintern, the coordinating body for communism worldwide. Togliatti turned it down because he wanted to remain in Italy. But he was one of the most prominent communist leaders in the entire world. In fact, he was almost personally responsible for a 1949 edict from the Vatican that excommunicated anyone who joined the Communist Party in Italy or who voted communist or who read communist literature because they were so afraid that Togliatti was going to lead the Communist Party to power in this country. Now, Cardinal Giuseppe Siri, on the other hand, was the hero of the traditionalist, conservative, fiercely anti-communist wing of the Catholic Church, both in Italy and worldwide. A famous Vatican journalist, Benny Lai, once did a biography of Siri. It was called The Pope Who Was Never Elected because he was a serious candidate for Pope four different times, 1958, 1963, and the two conclaves of 1978. In fact, so deep were Siri's anti-communist roots that after the 1958 conclave, an urban legend grew up that Siri, not John XXIII, had actually been elected pope in that conclave and had taken the name of Gregory XVII, but was quickly forced to abdicate because the Soviet Union threatened a nuclear strike on Rome because it was so intimidated and so afraid of Siri and the, the confrontation with the Soviet world that he would have led. Now, Siri has denied this. Everyone who ever looked at it has said it's bunk. But you, if you Google it, you will still find people who believe this was true. All of this by way of saying this was a highly improbable meeting. We don't know why Togliatti asked for this meeting. Siri is convinced that he wanted to see, that Togliatti wanted to see him not as the head of the church in Genoa or as an interlocutor with the Vatican, but as a priest. Think about what might have happened. I mean, is it possible that Togliatti, who, by the way, was born Catholic, he was born into a believing Catholic family in Genoa. In fact, his name, Palmiro, his first name, is a reference to Palm Sunday because he was born on Palm Sunday in the 1890s. Is it possible that Togliatti was considering a personal return to the faith? Is it possible he was considering some kind of reconciliation between communism and religious believers? And if so, how might that have affected 
the whole history of the Cold War, religious persecution behind the Iron Curtain, and on and on. I mean, it's a fascinating thought experiment. Unfortunately, we don't know the answers because the meeting never happened, but it is nevertheless fascinating to think about. Finally, this week, before we wrap up, we have talked before on this show about the mystery story of what happened to Omanuela Orlandi. This is a 15-year-old girl whose father worked in the prefecture of the papal household in the Vatican and whose family lived on Vatican territory. In 1983, Emanuela disappeared, just vanished into thin air. And ever since, her disappearance has been a magnet for conspiracy theories about the Vatican of all stripes. I won't go into it here, but just trust me, if you want to Google this for 30 seconds, you will find every conspiracy theory and its opposite about what was behind the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. All of this has been revived recently because there was a very successful Netflix documentary called Vatican Girl, a four-part special about the Orlandi case, and that seems to have sort of set the volcano erupting once again. And every other day, it seems, something new comes out of the woodwork. Here's what came out this past week. Number one, Italian true crime blog called Note Criminale, or Criminal Nights, published an entry in which it claimed to be in possession of a secret recording of a lieutenant of a famous Roman crime boss by the name of Enrico De Pedis, who has long been linked to the Orlandi case. A number of years ago, a former girlfriend of De Pedis by the name of Sabrina Minardi came forward to claim that De Pedis had asked her to take Orlandi a few days after her disappearance to take her in a car up to the Janiculum Hill and turn her over to some unnamed Monsignor. Okay, so De Pietis and Orlandi, their stories have been intertwined for a long time. What this recording, according to the blog, contains is this lieutenant of De Pietis naming a particular Vatican personality, a figure associated with the Vatican, as the interlocutor for the kidnapping, that is, as a guy who knew what was going on. Now, they did not give us the name of this figure. However, the blog did allow an Italian newspaper called Il Giornale to listen to it, and the reporter who listened wrote a piece in which he said, look, this recording has to be taken with a grain of salt, but if it turns out to be true, and this was his language, it will trigger an earthquake of catastrophic proportions in the Vatican language he used, earthquake of catastrophic proportions. Now, don't get too excited. We have been promised earthquakes of catastrophic proportions on the Orlandi case many times over the last 35 or so years. None of them have ever really been quite as catastrophic as projected. We will see. This blog has promised it's going to publish a full transcript of this recording soon. If so, you know, we will see whose name is named in how much meat there may be in that particular bone. So the full testimony given by Achete is still under lock and key in the offices of the Roman tribunal, but portions of it were published, and essentially it amounts to a blow-by-blow -blow account of the role of this guy I told you about, Enrico de Pedis, leader of this Roman sort of mob faction. According to Achete, he was intimately involved in the kidnapping and its aftermath, and he kind of reconstructs all of that. According to Achete, this Roman mob was acting on behalf of some shadowy, I guess, cabal in the Vatican that, number one, was opposed to John Paul II's hardline anti-communist posture, and number two, wanted to make the Vatican bank scandals go away quietly. In other words, they wanted to buy their way out of the scandal presumably because they had vested interests that they were afraid might be revealed. Now, you know, what merit any of this has, you know, I don't know. We'll have to dig through it. But the one thing I think we can say for certain is that it will keep pressure on the Vatican to address this case. And now, the Vatican has insisted multiple times that it has already disclosed everything it knows. That, however, has not persuaded people so the Vatican will, will face additional pressure to sort of 
convincingly make the case before the world, in, including a fairly skeptical cohort here in Italy, that it has in fact come clean. Here's one interesting footnote. As I said, this testimony from Echeti was, was collected as part of a Roman investigation by the, the tribunal here in Rome that was opened in 2008. Now that investigation was formally closed in 2015 by order of the guy who was sort of the chief prosecutor here in Rome at the time, a guy by the name of Giuseppe Pignatoni. You know what Pignatoni is doing now? He is the president of the Vatican's own tribunal, its own court. That's the gig he got when he resigned from the prosecutor's office. Now, you know, I, I don't want to make too much of this, but the conspiracy-minded certainly will be inclined, I would think, to draw a line between Pignatoni shutting down an investigation that could potentially have been embarrassing for the Vatican, and then later getting a pretty sweet Vatican gig not too long afterwards. Some, no doubt, will be tempted to see it as a payoff. You know, the, the fertility of the imaginations of people who were inclined to this sort of conspiracy thinking know no bounds. All right, that is our show for this week. You will find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. Again, that is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will talk to you very soon.